Hello everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast. This is where academic medicine meets remote, austere, and resource-limited areas. Uh, hi, Winston. You are choosing a pretty provocative title of uh, the oxygen as a friend or foe, the case against hyperoxia. Why did you choose this title for this week? Uh, good afternoon uh, to you, Brick. Uh, do you remember my last podcast was on lactate uh, metabolism as a result of uh, hypoxemia. So I just thought I'd like to investigate the the other end of the scale when there's too much oxygen in uh, in hyperoxia. And this was provoked by an article in December's issue of the BMJ, uh, which concluded that a increased supraphysiological oxygen administration during surgery did not appear to limit perioperative organ injury but could also increase the risk of kidney, heart, and lung injury. So I thought that was a rather important uh, uh, bit of information that would be useful, uh, very useful to all our listeners uh, when working in, uh, in uh, pre-hospital care. Yeah, in, in pre-hospital, we, we don't think about too much oxygen very often. It, it's all about a lack of oxygen. Can you just summarize the role of oxygen in uh, aerobic respiration? Yes, yeah, sure. Oxygen is really vital for aerobic respiration within the mitochondria, but it also produces ROS, which is reactive oxygen species. Now, oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor, the complex form of, of the electron transport chain, uh, producing water in the process. So for each mole of glucose metabolized by anaerobic respiration produces only two ATP molecules compared to 28 to 30 from oxidative phosphorylation that occurs in aerobic. So oxygen is really essential. Oxygen exists as a diatomic molecule bonded to each other through single bonds, leaving two unpaired electrons, which act as radicals. And that's what causes uh, the production of ROS, uh, which are even more reactive molecules producing superoxides, peroxide, and hydroxyl anions. So this, this is all the sort of the dangerous part of having too much oxygen. So any supplemental oxygen, which by definition is more than 0.21 or 21%, that's room air, may cause hyperoxemia, which is defined as arterial PO2 greater than 100 millimeters of mercury with an increase in ROS. And it's this increase in ROS that occurs in ischemia reperfusion problems or hypoxia reoxygenation problems that causes the damage. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that ROS is uh, uh, just dangerous. It's also vital physiologically for host defense, but is also toxic to organs, especially the lungs. Now, what is uh, uh, probably surprising for some of you is that 90% or so of oxygen consumption is used by, um, by the mitochondria for the ATP production in aerobic uh, uh, metabolism by oxidative phosphorylation. Second, it also provides heat generation through the uncoupling. And third, about one to two percent is for the uh, superoxide production, which is an important signaling molecule. So this molecule is important for enzyme processes such as oxidases, which is essentially an oxidation reduction reaction, oxygenases, which is incorporating oxygen into a substrate and superoxide production. So mitochondrial uh, uh, reactive oxygen uh, species increases both in hypoxia and hyperoxemia. And uh, for us as clinicians, it occurs in sepsis and ischemic reperfusion models. If it's the whole body as in resuscitation from cardiac arrest or major hemorrhage and trauma, uh, then it affects the whole body. But in myocardial infarction or stroke, uh, the, uh, it can be organ specific and therefore you only get the damage to the organ concern, the heart or the brain. Now, if you correct rapidly an acute hypoxemia, uh, that de the production of uh, ROS the reactive oxygen species may be as severe as the original ischemic insult. So this is where we've got to be really careful. And in addition to this problem, uh, there is acidification of the hypoxic tissues because uh, there is no oxygen delivery. The, there is a right shift of the oxygen dissociation curve. And when oxygen delivery is attained, it increases the superoxide production. 
And unfortunately, the body cannot deal with this high tissue oxygen tensions. So in inadequate metabolisms, it is mitigated by the body causing vasoconstriction, therefore reducing uh, local blood flow, especially in the cerebral and coronary vasculature. And this mechanism of vasoconstriction is partly due to the release of nitric oxide from S nitrosohemoglobin binding. But in addition to this problem, the activated immune cells use oxygen for extra mitochondrial ROS production, which helps in uh, phagocytosis. It also acts as an antioxidant capacity, which uh, uh, mediated through superoxide dismutase, glutathione, thioredoxin, etc., which prevents the oxidative damage to DNA, protein, lipids, and eventually cell death. And another important uh, part, uh, part of that oxygen plays is in the inflammatory response. And both in hypoxia and hyperoxia, you can produce pro and anti-inflammatory responses, which can be either protective or harmful, depending on the clinical situation. Now, you know that hyperoxia is used in hyperbaric uh, conditions for, uh, for promoting wound healing or treating gas gangrene. But because you're using it in a hyperbaric condition, it may co uh, cause neurotoxicity. So basically, hyperperoxia um, can affect uh, the lung, the brain, and the eyes. And in the eyes, it's particularly important in uh, immature newborn who get retrolental fibroplasia as a result of high oxygen concentrations. So that is really the role of... Um, of uh, uh, hy hyperoxia in causing uh, in both a physiological and pathological states. But that's interesting. So if, if you have a burn injury, not only are you getting problems with oxygen, you, uh, the inflammatory response of hyperoxia is going to increase inflammation from the burns or is, or is it completely different? It's, it's, uh, it's a, a slightly different because it uses different pathways, but the net effect is, uh, is still tissue toxicity and cell death. That's interesting. So, Winston, what are other effects of hyperoxia? Well, uh, 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 traditionally, the the damage uh, uh, acutely to the lung was first described by Lorraine Smith, who showed that hyperbaric pressures caused an inflam inflammatory pneumonitis. Uh, but if you bre were breathing high concentrations of oxygen in, uh, in normal baric conditions, the pneumonitis was seen after a few days. But that was the only start of it. Uh, the, these patients would present with retrosternal chest pain, coughing, dyspnea, pulmonary edema, and diffuse radiological lung shadowing. And because you're breathing oxygen, you have a nitrogen washout like you do in the pre-oxygenation prior to uh, 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 um, uh, uh, intubation in an emergency. And so because of the nitrogen washout, you will have atelectasis in the low uh, ventilation perfusion ratios. And the pulmonary toxicity um, from hyperbaric versus normal baric conditions is unclear. But in certain hyperbaric conditions, it's less inflammatory and is driven neurogenically, which can be blocked by either inhibiting nitric oxide synthase or by vagal transection. So it, it's a, a common pathway, either hyperbarically or normal barically. You still mess up the uh, lung tissue. Now, if the patient happens to be uh, on bleomycin, this is a, a drug uh, that can cause lung toxicity even with mild, mild hyperperoxia. But for the majority of us, this is not going to be a critical problem. It's just of historical uh, benefit. The second um, uh, problem is uh, affecting the brain uh, in terms of neurotoxicity. And this is called the Paul Burt effect. We know that if you have three atmospheres of oxygen, you produce convulsions and death and getting even quicker onset of symptoms with increases in, 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 uh, in bericity. So uh, what I want the, my, uh, our listeners to, uh, to appreciate is that high, high, uh, um, hyperbaric oxygenation or hyperoxia conditions uh, will have a uh, cytotoxic effect primarily on the lung and on the brain. That, that's interesting. So when you see 
a, a brand new EMT just hyperventilating uh, somebody with a suspected brain injury, that's going to cause additional damage to, to the brain. Correct. And we, we will uh, look at that in a little bit more detail as we go along at the list of clinical applications. All right. So let's look at clinical applic applications. So we do a lot of critical care focus in the college. So how in, in, in an ICU patient, how is hyperoxemia going to cause problems? Well, there was a, a, the original oxygen ICU trial suggested there was uh, a, cl a clinically important harm from liberal oxygen administration. And it was based on a single center RCT, 480 patients expected to stay in ICU for over 72 hours. The, uh, the results showed that the ICU mortality was 20.2% with conventional oxygen therapy, that is, you know, liberal, uh, no, no attempt to control, versus 11.6% with conservative oxygen therapy. However, other systematic reviews and meta-analysis showed that conservative oxygen use reduced uh, hospital mortality but with only very low certainty. And another trial, the ICU ROCKS trial, showed some reassurance that liberal oxygenation may be okay after all. So for the general ICU patients, where the patients are uh, of a heterogeneous um, uh, uh, nature, uh, no two patients are alike, it is difficult to uh, work out what is actually, uh, 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 the what should be the advice for the general ICU patient. Uh, so that's, that's basically, we uh, haven't got that resolved. So would you look at SpO2 or, or, or PaO2 as a, a outcome on too much or too little oxygen or what, what are you treating towards? Well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, consider that uh, in, in a few seconds, but essentially what we're uh, trying to achieve is a normal PaO, a, a normalizing PaO2 with a reduction as far as possible of the FiO2. That's, that's basically the bottom line. Another patient that we give, always, always, always give oxygen to is ARDS. Yeah. How does this work with uh, hyperoxemia? Well, this is an interesting thing because it's uh, unlike the general ICU patients, this is uh, very different because what you're trying to do here is titrate oxygenation to avoid hypoxemia and at the same time, hyperoxemia. So you're trying to, to uh, put a balance between the two extremes. In the hyperoxemia, the uh, ROS production injures the lung even more, causing oxygen stress, pro-inflammatory and cytotoxic effects, leading to reflex vasoconstriction, alveolar capillary leakage, and phypogenesis. So we tend to use a high FiO2 to correct hypoxic critically ill patients to avoid occult tissue hypoxia. In other words, you're trying to provide a buffer should a rapid uh, clinical deterioration occur. But we really don't have defined targets for PO2 or SPO2. So the ARDS network suggested a PO2 of 55 to 80 millimeters of mercury, whilst uh, the British uh, Thoracic Society suggested an SPO2 of 94 to 98 percent in acutely ill patients. So I hope that um, that gives uh, our listeners some sort of framework, a PO2 of 55 to 80 millimeters of mercury uh, or an SPO2 of 94 to 98 percent. We do, do drill that pretty heavily into our EMT and paramedic students and 94 percent or higher for your SPO2 and, and you're, you're doing pretty well. Anything less than that's a problem. In ARS, you have an impairment of gas exchange, which is an extra additional problem. So the higher FIL2 can cause direct damage, sensitized to further injury, worsening the innate immunity, and worsening the ventilation-induced injury. So we need to distinguish between high FiO2 and hyperoxemia. So paradoxically, the RDS preparation may be at less risk as they are unable to achieve extreme degrees of hyperoxia. So it seems that there is a U-shaped relationship between PaO2 and mortality in the RDS, with a time-weighted PO2 of 93.8 to 105 millimeters of mercury as the lowest mortality risk, which is almost identical to the liberal target of PO2 in the uh, LOCO2 trial. So essentially, uh, ARDS it is not as a problem as in the other critical states.
That's interesting. There's a buffer on our ARDS. Is that just because of uh, the, so much of the alveoli are covered with gunk that that's, that's, is that the buffer system or is there so something else? It's uh, the, the buffer system refers to the, when you have a hyper, hyperoxemic state, you've got more dissolved oxygen. So in case there is a, a future a clinical deterioration, uh, you have a reserve. So that's, it's, it's basically a, 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 a reserve oxygen uh, uh, acting as a buffer if something goes wrong in the next few minutes. It's interesting. So what about somebody with sepsis? Sepsis has hypoxic problems. What, what's the hyperoxia problem? Well, do you remember I, I mentioned earlier that hyperoxemia causes vasoconstriction? So in theory, hyperoxemia should help septic patients due to its vasoconstrictor effect, uh, counteracting the hypotension and also the antibacterial effects of hyperoxia. But hyperoxemia may cause an increase in ROS production and consequent oxidative stress-related tissue damage. And therefore, the feeling is avoid the PaO2 going uh, beyond 100 to 120 milli millimeters of mercury. So that's the sort of impact of hyperoxemia in sepsis and septic shock. There's a mm. theoretical benefit, but actually keep the PaO2 between 100 and 120 millimeters of mercury. And, and looking at the SpO2 isn't going to help at this point. Is that right? We definitely need a PO2 reading. Correct. So uh, what about TBI or, or brain injury? That's another one that we've been taught that you know, hyperoxemia is, is a good thing. How, how does this work with acute brain injury? Now, that's interesting because I, I wasn't aware of this. Uh, we, we all give a high FI2 in acute brain injury because we know that it can improve the brain tissue, PO2. But it seems to be a less of a problem on a global, large, hyperperfused brain, but very relevant in uh, relevant in small pericontusional areas, you know, in like the small areas of infarct. In addition, if you increase the FIL2, it increases the cerebral excitotoxicity. But after to uh, uh, traumatic brain injury, both hypoxemia and hyperoxemia is associated with uh, worse outcome. Unfortunately, just like in the general ICU patient, the optimal PL2 targets uh, still remain uh, to be determined. So what about trauma? So the, the, we, we focus quite heavily on trauma. I, mean, it, it, I was taught in the 80s and 90s that all trauma and hemorrhage casualties need lots and lots of oxygen. How does this work with hypoxia? Well, you know, you're, you're quite right. Supplemental oxygen is used because we're told that it will increase the amount of physically dissolved oxygen during blood loss related redu reductions in oxygen delivery. And we, we, uh, uh, base this on a uh, faster repay a, ox a tissue oxygen debt. In other words, if you pro uh, use higher FIO2s, uh, you pay, pay the oxygen debt quicker. But unfortunately, once the PO2 goes above 100 millimeters of mercury, then you have an enhanced ROS production, especially in ischemic rep uh, re uh, uh, re reperfusion or uh, hypoxia reoxygenation uh, uh, conditions. And what is fascinating, that pre-hospital emergency anesthesia, that is uh, uh, the, the sort of efforts we do in, in, uh, in, in uh, outside ho uh, hospital conditions, patients were usually hyperoxic on arrival in, in the emergency department. And the impact on uh, morbidity and mortality is still not known. But what is interesting, even in hospital medicine, in the um, uh, uh, department, uh, patients tend, uh, who are mechanically ventilated uh, tend to have uh, hypo uh, hy hyperoxemia. So again, in trauma and hemorrhage, uh, we will continue to do what we've done for years because, uh, again, there is no optimal target for the PAO2. What about CPR and acute myocardial infarction? That's something else that we've been has been drilled into us to push lots of oxygen. Yeah, I mean, well, I remember reviewing the first um, ALS uh, uh, publication in Britain in the early nineties, and you know we were told, oh, yeah, ventilate somebody with one hundred percent oxygen, and sadly, there's no study with a lower FiO two to make the comparison. So we're we're just doing things on an historical basis. There are observations, however, 
to uh, to suggest there is an association be, be, uh, between a higher PO2 during CPR and the likelihood of ROSC survival and neurologic outcome. But hmm. if you imagine yourself in CPR. It's very difficult to titrate the FiO2 during CPR. So you 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 know it's there, there is a a practical problem of titrating FiO2s during a CPR uh, process. And as I've uh, mentioned before, if you've got a hyperoxemia, the body's compensation is to have a vasoconstriction. So now you have a problem with potentially coronary artery vasoconstriction. So in balance, uh, the recommendation is to aim for a uh, uh, to target a strict normal eczemia, but avoiding hypoxemia, and essentially um, making sure that your saturations is not less than ninety percent in a, uh, in acute myocardial infarctions. So basically, try and keep it above ninety percent, but not uh, not not to try and get the high levels of nineties. That's that's interesting because uh, the a lot of the vents that we use pre-hospital, they just have a setting on them say, saying CPR. So we don't. You're you're right. We don't look at FiO two. We don't look at IE ratios. We we just hit that one button that says, "All right, we're we're doing CPR and the vent's doing its thing." Do you think that's a wrong setting? No, I don't think it's a wrong setting, Ibra, because I think uh, uh, you know we, we mustn't just try and look at just this one factor of hypoxemia uh, or hyperoxemia you know in 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 uh, an acute life uh, um, uh, emergencies there are lots of confounding factors uh, patients comorbidity medication etc 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 so I, I don't think we should uh, throw the the baby with the bathwater I think we just have to be uh, conscious of uh, oxygen as a drug I mean you know, my favorite phrase is think big. I think of oxygenation. <laughs> uh, yeah. Elimination. And that may be a, a little bit facile, um, but in, in effect, in an emergency, that's what you do. The question is, once you've got ab above the acute stage, when do you start looking at the FIL2? When do you start looking at the PL2 and aiming for no normoxemia? Or uh, keeping it below below the thresholds of 100 uh, to 100 uh, to 120 millimeters uh, PaO2. So that's what I'm saying. So there is a, there is a uh, to make that next step. I think will take a few years. Uh, that makes sense. And it's not until we get ROSC of a casualty that we start we we take the vent off of the CPR setting and we start playing with the different ratios. So that makes sense. Yeah. So. You're a consultant anesthetist, so let's talk about something a little more in a controlled setting, in a perfect world, Winston. So let's talk about theater and, and surgery. How would you adjust hyperoxemia as a consultant anesthetist? It's, uh, well, if you remember, uh, the, art the article I referred to in the BMJ in December uh, 2022 was just uh, a warning shot against uh, clinical practice about just... Um, uh, Increasing the FiO2, uh, increasing the PaO2, without actually um, uh, looking at the downside of doing this. Now, the, uh, as you know, in in anesthesia, we use an FiO2 of thirty percent or 0.3, while room air is 0.21. And the reason why you use a slightly higher FiO2 is to compensate for the reduction in FRC, VQ mismatch, and shunts. However, there was another trend because the surgeons suddenly uh, sort of uh, found that if you used higher FiO2s, say 80%, it, it was used to uh, thought to be better in preventing surgical wound infections. But actually, subsequent tri trials showed actually there was very little difference between patients who received 80% versus 30% uh, 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 FiO2. Hmm. And the additional problem. If you use a higher FiO2 of 80%, your cancer-free survival is reduced. Wow. This is not surprising because I told you uh, earlier on in, in this podcast that one of the problems about uh, hyperoxemia is that you 
uh, you mess up the innate immunity of the body. And just as a, 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 a reminder of how complex it is, uh, morphine also reduces immunity uh, when used during surgery. So basically a high, higher FiO2 and the use of morphine can have implications uh, on the immune process in a patient who's got cancer. And the last thing you want in a patient with cancer is a suppression of, uh, of uh, immunity. Mm. Now, the other thing uh, which is very interesting, you know, we, we teach our, our, our medics uh, to, to do a pre-oxygenation using a high FiO2 um, and, and, and then um, to allow us that buffer of oxygen in case intubation becomes difficult. Now, what, uh, what we should be doing is, now, if you know that if you uh, breathe in 100% oxygen, you've lost the nitrogen skeleton. So you get significant atelectasis uh, within, the, 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 uh, within the lungs. And one way of eliminating this is to do a recruitment maneuver, just giving a big... Um, a, a bigger uh, single tidal uh, volume or a couple of them followed by 5 to 10 centimeters of PEEP. So for a practical basis, the, the use of uh, a recruitment maneuver and low uh, amounts of uh, uh, PEEP uh, can counteract the atentesis that occurs when breathing uh, high um, FIL2s, which is... Mm. A, uh, an FIO2 of 0.8 or 80%. However, the, it was the WHO that started this bandwagon of that all intubated patients should uh, to should have a FIO2 of 80% to prevent post-operative infection. But I, I think the, the 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 feeling now is that it is uh, controversial. And what what the consensus is is to consider the patient's comorbidity and titrated to normoxemia. So basically, the, the message is keep things within a, a physiological uh, limits, avoiding hypoxemia and avoiding hyperoxemia. Winston, can I ask you about hyperoxemia and scuba diving? Because as, as a dive master, we've been as drilled into us about the oxygen toxicity once you go down to depth. And you mentioned earlier that three atmospheres of oxygen is toxic. Is, is there a correlation or causation here? Uh, no. Uh, first of all, can I can I just say you've you've rather nicely led me to the conclusion of this podcast. So thank <laughs> you. Um, uh, I will rephrase the 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 the, the question uh, and say there will be clinical applications of hyperoxy, uh, hyperoxia uh, in cases like carbon monoxide intoxication, gas embolism, and decompression injury. So. Um, now, for, for our, our uh, medics in the pre-hospital environment, you're unlikely to get hyperbaric uh, conditions. But what is fascinating is that in carbon monoxide poisoning, hyperbaric uh, uh, oxygenation is as good as normobaric pure oxygen breathing just by, or, uh, by, by, uh, by uh, using a bag valve mask. Okay? Mm. So the good point, the good news is that as long as you can give a carbon monoxide patient uh, uh, a high FIL2, the washout of carbon monoxide is good. And, it, uh, and this is um, also shown by patients arriving at hyperbaric chambers uh, tend not to need it uh, on arrival because they've had high FIL2s in transit. Mm. So to summarize the whole uh, issue is avoid a PAO2 of greater than 300 millimeters of mercury uh, avoid the excesses between hypoxemia and excessive hyperoxemia. So aim for about a PO2 of 100, 100 to 120 milliliters of mercury. Or if uh, you are not sure because uh, using a travel ventilator where the FR2 cannot be controlled or can or, uh, not controlled easily, aim for an SPO2 of 94 to 98 percent in a normal patient. Uh, as normal as you can be, uh, because you may not know much details of your patient, and 88 to 92 percent in those of risk of hypercapnic respiratory failure. So, though I'm, I might have given you a little bit of a depressing um, and almost uh, con conflicting uh, evidence for hyperoxemia, uh, 
I think uh, just go back to uh, basics and keep the uh, the oxygen levels within normal limits, and you'll probably minimize the dangers. And as you you yourself suggested earlier on, if you can control the FIL2 uh, and, and maintain a saturation of 94 to 98% for a normal patient, normal healthy ASA 1-2 patient, or 88 to 92% in ASA 3 and 4 patients, especially those with uh, chronic lung disease, uh, the chances are that you will do your uh, patients some good. Thank you for that, Winston. It's it's definitely deep diving into a, a topic that, at the paramedic level, we've we just been told, all right, well, this is this is why we would hyper uh, oxygenate or wouldn't hyper oxygenate, and now we have a much better understanding of the pathophysiology of that. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. We'll see you next month, Winston. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, and uh, all the best. This has been a presentation from the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine Foundation. If you would like to earn CPD credit for this podcast, you can join the Council of Members. Being a member of the college gives you free CPD credits, free access to the virtual field guide, and discounts on our e-learning courses. You can join the team on the college website, which is quorum, C-O-R-O-M, quorum.org.